Morning, gents. How are we doing? Who is the footballer of the year? Nice handy question to get you going here. <laughs> you always like to spring one of these on me, Ger. Uh, I think Myler has to be in the mix. Um, you know, people probably won't give him the plaudits because he's not probably getting on the scoreboard an awful lot, but, but he's been a guy who, uh, there's he's been their go-to guy to take out you know, one of the main opposition's uh, uh, leaders um, and their main threats. And he did that again last at the weekend with Durkin. Um, you know, he was phenomenal. Um, he obviously did it against Kerry too. So he's he, he's definitely in the mix. You know, I think McCurry, I think, deserves an awful lot of of, of, of um, plaudits because, you know, he's a guy who probably went through a period where he came on the scene you know, with a burst and, you know, was very, very dangerous, but then was in and out of the team. And, and you know, he cut a very frustra- frustrated figure for a while. I don't know if you remember, but there was a period there where, you know, Mickey Hart was trying lots and lots and lots of different, con- you know, kind of uh, um, um, connections up front, especially in the full forward line. And lads were getting whipped off, you know, at half time and even before half time. And there was a, you could sense the level of frustration in that forward line because things weren't clicking. Um, and I know he even spoke about it that he went off himself and he had to to find the dazzler or whatever it, it, he calls himself. So it's interesting, you know, because he came back and he's been phenomenal this year. You know, very very confident. He stands over a free kick. I was, you know, I was in at the game and I was chatting to the guy beside me. I was just saying, there's a massive conference in the rest of the Tyrone players. They all turn around, they walk away. Like literally, it's from wherever there's a free, it's going to go over. You know, he has such a nice style. Um, he's massive confidence and obviously he scores 1-4 in an All-Ireland that's, that's not bad going Yeah and I think actually this is one of the other aspects of it talking to a, a Tyrone supporter in the aftermath of the game I was like oh it's a big change from last year and uh, the Tyrone people certainly the ones that I was talking to in the aftermath of the game were full sure that there was still a lot of Mickey Hart in that team um, I'm not I'm not as sure about it as they might be and I'm, I, I don't know if, like obviously there's an intense loyalty to uh, Mickey for what he did over that period of time but stuff like McCurry stuff like the absence of an out and out sweeper is actually a transformative thing for for the individuals where, where there's clearly confidence instilled in the players you know we trust that you're going to be somebody who's vital to us we're not going to take you off when things go wrong we're not going to take you off the freeze if you miss one or two of them and then not having a sweeper is like a, we trust you as defenders and you have to you have to be the one who's going to be responsible as opposed to looking for one of your mates to come and rescue you it's just it, they're small and they're subtle differences but they're hugely important at the end of the season massively massively important and and i think it's you know i heard i heard uh, uh, um uh Colin Kavanagh talking there last week about the fact of the, the change. And I was I heard a lot of debate post the game of well, you know, have they changed much, you know, since since Mickey Hart's time? And I think they've changed a massive amount, um, as a matter of fact, in a very, very short space of time. And in, in an even more confined space of time due to everything that's gone on with COVID. So they've had to make these alterations very quickly. And they've had to make alterations post the Kerry game because he referenced, even Dewar referenced that Kerry game, the league game again. Like, I mean, at a very, very important time, he referenced that game on, on, on Saturday evening. So that game had a, had a massive imprint on what they did this year and how they viewed what they were going to do going forward. Um, you know, I spoke to Andy McGinley about this. He felt that they were trying something in that Kerry game and it was completely, it just didn't work at all. And they kind of went, right, okay, well, we're, we're parking that. We're not going to go there. Of course, there's still an imprint from Mickey Hart's time. You know, there, there's still an awful lot of players, obviously, who were there from Mickey Hart's time. So you're not going to completely rip everything up overnight. And there was no need to do it. But certainly the sweeper had to be ha- had to be taken out. And it was interesting, Colin Cavanagh talking about it, because, you know, predominantly he was the one who was, who was obviously employed in that position. So when you're when you're playing that sweeper system and you're and, and, and if you remember Tyrone what they would do is they'd obviously get the bodies behind the ball they would try to snag you and then they would look to break there's a there's a subtle difference now in the sense of they're tagging men as they come back and they're applying a lot more pressure around the middle third of the field and um, they're also trusting themselves as you say they're trusting themselves to be one-on-one that full back line have no problem being one-on-one you know like Hamsey uh, um, has had no issue taking on some of the best lads one-on-one and they're and they're comfortable with having their buddy beside them and saying listen if it's two on two in here we'll take that we don't need extra protection so that of course affords you to allow p- players to be further up the pitch and of course it affords you to have more forward threat when you get the ball um, and have more energy and uh, you know ultimately I think that's the that's that's the key difference to to, to what Doher and Logan have brought to this team. It's interesting the cliche about Tyrone Anthony was that they love being an underdog they love being written off and 
I kind of thought that they weren't being written off whatsoever before the weekend, except for one area, which was they were going to win the midfield battle. Because there's no chance that Toronto are going to win the midfield battle because of what happened to them in the, the semi-final, that they won in spite of the fact that Niall Morgan's long kickouts weren't doing any damage. As it turned out, his long kickouts in the All-Ireland final all of a sudden did, did massive amounts of damage. So that Tyrone midfield, not just the middle third, that midfield, how impressed were you with their emergence as, as real top-class stars on Saturday night? Well, I think, you know, we spoke about this prior or post the Kerry game. Like, I, t- I, I didn't think he would be under the same pressure because Ruan and Loftus are more... They're not your classic old style midfielder to say David Moore is, as in a big man who's able to go up six foot four and he's able to catch ball and he's able to put massive pressure across that middle that 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 whole middle section of the of of of, of the pitch. You know they're kind of more half forwards. Ruan's a bit bigger than Love, but they're kind of more of a half forward, very very mobile, very able to go at you, you know, pick up ball and run at you, rather than being really dominant under a high ball. So when I looked at that kind of Mayo team, I said, you know what, I don't see many fellas who are going to go up and fetch ball over the two boys who are in the Tyrone panel. And what they learned was, and if you watch it, they look for a lot of tap downs, tap downs overhead, tap downs to fellas come and running. And they essentially took that kind of, you know, as that I suppose that contest out of the game. They, they mo- most of the big moments came from a situation where Morgan was under pressure on a short kick out, and he was confident enough that he was just going to letter this ball sixty yards and let them fight for it. And actually, Mayo men, if you watch it, got caught in front an awful lot of the time, where they were kind of backpedaling. You know, under a lot of pressure, and Tyrone guys were in behind, knowing that he has the ability to go that long. So, you know, it's interesting, as you say, Owen, there was that feeling that, you know, his kickouts would be under pressure, but he, he wasn't at all. Um, you know, I was in there, I was I was on the lower Hogan, I was at him at first, I had, I had a brilliant view of, of his ability to pick out guys, and he never, ever once was under pressure, in my view. Like, I mean, certainly his, his exterior didn't show anything as regards him being under pressure. You know, he was well able to ping ones out to his left when he needed short. He was well able to off the outside of his right boot, put them out over to the sideline. But I also thought Mayo, Mayo, you know, Mayo made it relatively easy for him uh, uh, on a lot of the kickouts. And I just think Mayo, I, I don't, I think I think they thought what was going to happen against Kerry with, with his kickouts would happen again. And I think they planned for that. And I think they got a little bit caught out by it. Um, they allowed players Essentially, they, they seem to be allowing a plus one to happen um, and had more players in around the mid, middle section. And they were allowing easy kickouts to happen, especially out to Morgan's right. Um, invariably, a half forward would come down and it would be a bit of confusion and he'd just pop it out and, and, and they'd start to attack. Um, the two, the two midfield, I have to say, they absolutely emptied themselves. They were brilliant. They broke up attacks. Um, uh, I think it was Kirkpatrick, I think, who got, or no, it was actually Brian Kendi who got an early yellow, and I was a bit worried for him. I thought it was, you know, it was rough enough yellow, um, and, I, and I didn't think he'd last, but he had a phenomenal game. So, um, yeah, it was a, certainly a section that I think they 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 dominated. But it's interesting to hear, Owen, and I, 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 you know, I'd like, I think, I think this this thing is an amazing thing. You probably slip into the Mayo stuff on this as well, but it's interesting to hear Tommy talking to McGeary there. And he mentioned identity, you know, and he said, we have an identity, uh, he said, and we were reminded of that. Now, if you want to go with identity and you want to talk about Tyrone, well, even more so than Peter Canavan, who I think was just an unbelievably phenomenally talented player, the man who epitomized the identity of Tyrone in those 2000s was Brian Dewar. You know, he was a fella who, when we played them, we earmarked him as, as the guy just to take out more so than Kavanaugh or anyone. He needed to be man-marked throughout the game. He was the beating heart of the team. You know, not a very, very big man, not a very, very fast. I mean, he didn't, you wouldn't be putting him at the kind of nine out of 10 in anything if you were if you were putting the characteristics of a Gaelic footballer up. But I tell you what, for heart, determination, and and drive and ruthlessness, he was that. And McGeary, I know, said we'd keep our identity to the dressing room. But I'd say that it was absolutely their identity and what they were really honing in on. Um, and when I look at Mayo, I'm kind of going, where is their identity? You know, what if I was putting it up on the wall in three, three, three words, I, I, I still think they're I still think they're grasping for that. And I still actually think that when it comes down to it, that ruthlessness, that identity that Tyrone have is ultimately what brought them across the line. One of the things I was talking about this a little bit earlier on was um, the the space and I think this might feed into the, the point you made about Niall Morgan having somebody to kick the ball out to essentially 
Henley stays in goals. He is a goalkeeper. Uh, you know, obviously he'll come out a little bit, but not not on the press, not the way when they were down to 14 men that Cluxon came out and, and added a plus one to make sure that there was nowhere for Kerry to kick the ball out in the last minute of the game uh, in the drawn game in 19. Uh, and it just seems like Ulster football is ahead of the curve with everybody else. Like Tyrone had to overcome Monaghan who are giving them this weird stuff they've never seen before. And it's like, just the brain power required to think about that is different from the challenge that Mayo had faced. And as a result, Mayo have been happy enough to keep Henley in goals. But certainly, you're watching it and it's man on man the whole pitch and Henley's in goals and Tyrone are finding someone to kick the ball out to even though they have a goalkeeper who has to kick the ball out to him. You're like, how's that happening? Yeah. Do it's, we, it's, it's, is, is that a problem for the rest of the country to start thinking about and fixing immediately? I, I think it's funny. You know, I often thought about this. I remember sitting down with Kieran McGinney a couple of years ago and we were talking about midfield and how he felt midfield was going to change from the big man in midfield of our days when you just kicked out, lamped out the ball into the middle of the pitch. You know, and, and, and I remember he was reading uh, Moneyball, the book, you know, when I was sitting down having a coffee with him and I was asking him, but I'd never seen the, or heard about the movie and I was chatting to him about it. So McGinney was a guy, obviously, and still is a guy who thinks about the game and he, and he tries to look well ahead of where changes will occur in the game and then i met him a couple of years later when we were chatting about different things and he was trying if you remember to play this sweeper keeper um and he was being lambasted actually for it um you know fellas were saying what's he doing you know this is ridiculous the crowd were going bananas when 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 the keeper would come out you know even beyond the 21 with the ball imagine that well now you have lads who are obviously soloing all the way up into the opposition half and it is it's a player, you know, he, he may have number one on his back. He might have a big pair of gloves, but at the end of the day, he should have the skills and the adaptability to be able to play the game just as an outfield player. And essentially that's what's happening. You know, I've often said myself, how many times do you really have a shot stop? You might have two in a game, maybe three, but how many times do you get the ball in your hands as a keeper? You could get it 15, 20, 25 times, especially if you're just giving a short kick out and getting it back. So essentially, you could play with a sweeper keeper, and this is what you have going on, especially as you say in Monaghan. So when you look at the two teams, Ger, some of the biggest moments happened in that game on, on Saturday night, where one team had a, had a goalkeeper who was absolutely adept at being able to come out off his line, take the ball on, deliver long range passes out of his hand. If you remember the chance for, 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 for um, McCurry. From McCurry, yeah, that came from him stepping out. He comes out of the pocket, he's happy, and he drills this beautiful long range right for the ball, right down on top of McKenna, who manages to, to get because it was on. It reminded me of the, the, the Donegal Dublin game. Um, but let's look at the goal situation. Like, if you remember, uh, there was a ball put in, I think, by O'Donoghue, and he came out off his line, and there was a Mayo man about to catch it, and there was danger all over it if he caught the ball, and he came out, and he went out over the top of the Mayo man and got his fist on it. Actually, I think, sorry, he, he grabbed it above him, came down with the ball, and it could have been for that chance. And then let's switch to the Henley uh, and McShane goal. So if you if you go and watch that, rewind that again, Conor Myler gets the ball out under the, 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 the Hogan stand, you know, he's about probably 30 metres out. Um, and I've been here before and I know exactly the situation. McShane makes a bit of a run forward. He doubles back and he points across with his left hand as if to put it just basically out into the D. And the ball that Myler puts in actually doesn't bring him out to the D, but means that he has to back up. And if you watch this the, the, as the ball is kicked, Henley is actually standing behind his line on the goal line. He's not even out of, out, out of the goal a little bit. He's, 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 he's actually standing behind the goal line. Whereas, you know, if that's Morgan or if that's a guy who's thinking, listen, I'm actually playing more as a defender than a goalkeeper, he's probably standing outside the small parallelogram or he's probably even six or seven yards out. So when Myler looks up to even give the pass, Myler sees two against one. So he says, well, I'm not putting the ball in there. Um, and in, invariably, if he does try to pass, well, then you have a man coming from behind who, by the way, if I'm a defender, I'm saying, listen, if there's anything above my head and I'm backing up, you come, you clean me, him and everything around you. Um, and if you watch it, as the ball is in flight, of course, you know, Henley hesitates a bit. Then he goes um, and McShane just gets the flick on it and back of the net. Um, and ultimately, that was a massive, massive change in the game because... You know, Mayo were coming back well into it. They had started well the second half. You could you'd see they'd increased their energy levels. 
they were chasing Tyrone down more, um, and 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 they were really starting to threaten, and that was a big, big, big uh, uh, um, factor in the game. And that and that's even outside of I know your point you're making. That's even outside of the rest of the game where you know Morgan is adding value as he's coming out as say a link man, whereas Henley, as you say, is basically you being used as a goalkeeper. So I think most teams around the country are going to have to decide. Um, are going to have to look at it because essentially it is an extra player. Exactly. And like, I wonder, is it just hammered home a little bit more this year, Anthony? Not so much because Niall Morgan's in an All Ireland final, but because of the way the game has developed this year in particular, where the blanket defence has been phased out really, uh, like, quite emphatically this year, where you almost look at a game as a proper 15 on 15. It's just a collection of pairs all around the pitch. So your goalkeeper all of a sudden is the one person who's not being marked. There is no systemic defence where, you know, you've got a, a cornerback who can make a burst through. It is literally your goalkeeper who is the only free man on the pitch. And as a result of that, it's become the year where Niall Morgan, the, the possibly the best outfielder who's actually playing in goals for his county, actually triumphs. Absolutely. Well, you know... <laughs> My wife does basketball, and I was actually chatting to her about it. And it was she always it amazed her over the last number of years, where she say like, "Why, why doesn't the guy in goals come out with the ball?" You know, and I was kind of saying, "Yeah, he probably should." You know, like because he could be the point guard. You know, that's essentially it. Um, and I think they're turning more into the point guard now. They're turning more into a person who's able to dictate. Because the old adage was, I'll let the keeper have it. Jeez, let the keeper have it. You know, he'll, he'll kick it up his arse or something like this, you know, because it was always the feeling that they were absolutely useless with the ball in hand. Well, <laughs> that is no longer, that's no longer the thing. You know, they can come, they can deliver long passes. If you saw, he he also delivered a lovely hand pass. I think, can't remember who it was to, um, but he popped it out over about three or four guys into the path of, of one of the cornerbacks who just raced down the middle of the field. It could have been Frank Burns. Um, so once you have those skills, um, you know, as, as the opposition, you're now saying, well, what do we do? Do we leave him with the ball? Do we try and snag him? Do we try and corral him into a section? Um, do we just mark everybody else up and kind of say, yeah, come on out with the ball, come out 40, 50, 60 yards and slowly, you know, slowly kind of pull in on him. Um, but if he's really, really, really good, all of a sudden he can come out those 20 or 30 yards and he can deliver a bomb which which happens you know straight down into the in, into your full back line um and the way teams are playing if you're smart enough what you would do then is you would run towards him as a forward unit and leave your big man or your two one and one inside and just let him deliver those balls because ultimately those keepers are also they're delivering a ball from an area where it can cause the maximum amount of damage so like i think look it's it's, it's a tactic that i think a lot of people are looking at and it's a brilliant every year there's always something different you know uh, that everyone goes, oh, geez, we must do that. Um, but the smart guys will obviously be thinking, okay, what do we do post this? So yeah. what do we do actually to stop this or what do we do to even enhance it even more? The uh, fear that is manifest from Owen and from uh, the Kerry people here is that Tyrone are here now for another decade of dominance, that they're going to be the team of the uh, the 20s as well. You can kind of see it in Owen this morning. You can see it in Fitzmaurice. <laughs> is uh, this could be the start of something big for Tyrone and they don't like it. Obviously they don't like it because there's a particular peculiar set of ghosts that Tyrone bring for uh, for Kerry. Are they here for, like, is, is this a, a, a one-off? I mean, we, we obviously always live in the now and go, geez, this team's going to be very hard to beat. But are Dublin looking at this? Are Kerry thinking, ah, Jesus, we had that. We, we were definitely able to win that semi-final if a few things had gone our way. Does, does the win... Annoy people, inspire them. If if the Dubs get Paul Mannion back, are they thinking we can have those lads? Come on. I th I think there's I think there's two ways of looking at it actually. Um, I think Owen and his his kin are are are, are right to be worried uh, because I actually think you, you mean own... the impartial football observer, Anthony. <laughs> That's exactly it, Owen. <laughs> That's exactly it. <laughs> like the rest of us. I no. I you know it's funny. I look back on the game and I was I, I, I watched it again last night. Um, I think Tyrone were very, very smart the way they played. Um, and they got the goals at vital times. Um, and you could say that, you know, uh, especially, you know, nearly decisions were made for them. Like, I mean, if you look at the Henley goal, uh, the, the one, as I said, we just spoke about there, the McShane one, and even the, even the, even the, the McKenna hand pass across, 
you know, there was always a thing what I, we, you know, we'd say in our defense is that, you know, you never, you never make up the mind of the forward. Don't make his mind up for him. Let him make the decision. And if you even watch that goal, lads rushed out and Henley rushed out and they made the decision. It was a brilliant no-look pass, but they made the decision for him rather than him having to make the decision. If you flip the far end, when 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 um, uh, Tommy Conroy was on the run, the defenders backed off. They backed off. They kind of said, "Listen, if you take that bounce or extra solo, now we'll come in on you." But they made him make a decision. He made a rash decision, as did a number of the Mayo forwards, and they didn't get the goal. So Mayo will even look back on it and go, "Oh, we had chances. We had chances, definitely for two or three goals, um, definitely too." You know, even taken without taking out the penalty. So could they have been there? Could they have made it a lot tighter? Could they have even won it? Yes, they could have. But at the same time, I think Tyrone were in control of the game. Um, you know, Tyrone were shooting a lot well within the, the scores they were getting in the first half seemed to come a lot easier for mm. them. Um, they were well able to shoot from outside the range. So if you watch them, they were happy enough to get their shooters on the outside and clip over scores rather than going into, you know, the kind of the net that that Mayo would have wanted them to go into and then try to counter-attack them and get up the field quick because that was Mayo's Mayo's kind of strategy. So, you know, I look at Tyrone and I see the quality that they have. I see the leaders that they have. I see all the ability that they have, but I still think they're going to come through an Ulster Championship next year that's only getting better and better and better. When you look at Derry, when you look at Armagh, when you look at Monaghan, when you look at Donegal, like, I mean, there's teams emerging now that were, were, were kind of weaker in the last number of years, but are only getting stronger and stronger down. Um, so they're going to have a tough spell coming through Ulster. And then also, yes, I think... Kerry will look and say, you know what, for all the mistakes and all the messing and all the naivety that we that we had and displayed in that game, we were we were within, you know, a kick of a ball of bringing that game to the debt. Um, and really, you know, if we had if we had spread the scores around a bit more and been a bit smarter, we probably should have won it. So I don't think they'd be shaking in their boots just yet. Um, I really don't think so, uh, uh, Jared, to be honest with you. But there's no doubt about it that Tyrone, um, I think, have, have brought something different um, but I don't think they're a team that are necessarily going to dominate for the next 10 years. Not not yet. What, what, what was your read on the Aidan O'Shea situation then, Anthony? Because I saw you tweeting about this at the weekend. Yeah, I just think, you know, I actually thought he played quite well. Um, I, I thought Mayo used him smart in the first half. They used him as a big man. Like, I my team with Aiden, like I've marked Aiden when he was a young lad, um, and he, and he's a physically physically massive man. I probably had I don't know maybe ten years on him, and, and I thought I would have had the strength on him. But he's he's a big big man as everyone knows. But he's also quite quick over those first three or four yards. He's well able to move, um, and once he has his arms out, it's impossible to get around him. So you have to nearly you have to allow him to get the ball, or you have to foul him. So when he gets the ball. If he has runners coming off them left or right, his hands are good enough to be able to shift left, shift right, and then he has runners. Mayo didn't, they did it a little bit in, in the first 20, 25 minutes of the, fir the first half, but actually they started to really get it going in those last 10 minutes. And they should have had, if you remember, a goal out of it near the, near the end of the first half. Um, I think it was, uh, it wasn't horror, it was, it was um, Oshin Mullen, I think, went past him and he just slipped him a little hand pass, lovely little hand pass. But they, when they use him as a fulcrum, as a focal point in that full forward line, and they were able to put balls in in front of him, it was working well. Um, when they allowed him then having to try to turn, take shots himself, that wasn't that wasn't great because that's not his game. So, you know, I was very disappointed. The responsibility was on his fellow players to be able to get off him, come at angles, you know, know that the ball is coming in, a little slip pass, and then stick it over the bar. But it was still causing enough panic. But in the second half, they completely abandoned it for yeah. some reason. I don't know why they did it. You know, he, he he was still winning ball in front of Hamsey. But the second half, they kind of said, no, you're going to drift out. Whether he drifted out himself, he was trying to get into the game. You would see he was trying to influence the game. He was getting on the ball around midfield. Um, and look, Aiden is never going to be scoring, you know, six, seven points for you. That's not the type of player he is. Um, but I thought, you know, I thought it was disappointing for me. I... I I, there was a couple, I mean, of the six forwards that started for Mayo, you know, really only two of them, I would feel, or maximum three of them played uh, to the level that you have to play in an All-Ireland final. I think of the six defenders that started, possibly five of them played above the level. You know, Keegan was absolutely enormous. Like, I mean, just, you want to talk about players of the year, I think he has to go in there, even though he lost the All-Ireland final. Like, I mean, he was just phenomenal. Like, when they needed him, he made runs 
you know, wrong again after again after again, just saying, give me the ball, give me the ball, I'll do something with it. Um, his leadership was was phenomenal. Like, I mean, I just 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 to watch him, what he was doing, like McKenna, McCurry, they were both under savage pressure going after him. Um, and especially after Tyrone had taken Durkin out because they obviously focused on him and they said, well, we're not going to let him do the damage that he normally does. But there was a couple of other lads and, and unfortunately for Mayo, and we spoke about this prior to the game again, they had zero impetus and zero threat off the bench, really, lads. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, they had no one to come in who was a full forward or a corner forward who was going to come in and score four or five points no. and say, "Give me the ball." And 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 unfortunately, that 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 really that that told on them. And obviously, the Killian O'Connor injury was ultimately probably caught up with them. A bridge too far, definitely. Anthony, good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us. Cheers. No bother, lads. Cheers. Anthony Moyes giving us his thoughts there on the All-Ireland football final. We're going to talk about the Camogie final with the Galway captain after a late surge won the game for them um, against the Cork side who were dogged and uh, that one definitely went and could have gone either way in the end. But Galway, the All-Ireland champions, we're going to speak with their captain a little bit later on. I'm going to speak with Niall Morgan who is definitely a shout for Footballer of the Year. Certainly has one of the most interesting stories of the year. Uh, in about 15-20 minutes time as well it's 8.36 this morning OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette good mornings start with Gillette put your best face forward with their new and improved razors who's your footballer of the year? I think Conor Myler is probably going to be front and centre I think Niall Morgan I, I said to you after the Kerry game uh, you could put a, a few quid in him and see what happens but I think even despite being able to shout from out of the match on Saturday probably hasn't done enough because Myler was so good again the last day I think Kieran McGeary has a hell of a chance as well and it'll be between those three to roam in for me to, to win it McCurry maybe uh, a very outside shot um, they have a lot of good footballers don't they that's the thing you that's think the about thing. it like Sludden McCurry Donnelly like just classicists who can kick the ball over as soon as you give them a tiny bit of space that long range shooting point that Anthony makes there it's like well, if you're going to beat us with 12 long range points then fair play to you it's like oh you just did that didn't you yeah do you know what it kind of feels like um kind of like a mid-tier Premier League team where a big team has signed a player but they've signed a good replacement immediately to replace them and they've got this constant revolving door of a, like a really good level player except it's not the Premier League they have all these players and it felt like Donnelly's had good years here and there same with Sludden but they've got them all playing well together in one year and that's good management that's yeah. a really good culture and that's why they've won this year and I think it's identity everybody having a job the, the, Paddy Andrews said a great thing about uh, sitting down with Jim Gavin I don't expect you to score 10 points from play it's going to be very nice if you do but I expect you to do your job if you do your job and everybody else does their job we're going to be fine and there's a sense that everybody understands in Tyrone what their job is it's very clear it's clearly defined when you have the ball when you don't have the ball uh, you know and, and look again this is all post but it, it's post big matches now where they've displayed that consistently over the course of the year like Peter Hart is it fair to say he's had his best season this year and he's I think 30? so he's only 30 like he could go on to 34 or 35 yeah. and that's you know they're going to be at the very top of their game for the next period of time as well so they, there was just everything in, in their game like we mentioned the Hamsey point earlier on there was the I mean the, the, the cuteness of the McShane uh, goal there was the art of the high fielding which we all thought was dead by Con Kilpatrick and also by Peter Hart, obviously. Okay, just a point on that. Okay, so Peter Hart does take his mark, but Kilpatrick doesn't take his mark, right? And there's mm. there's a world in which he is conditioned to take his mark, and we don't get that goal. Like it's it's a possibility. Why are we doing that? Yeah, like I I do think that when it comes to the midfield mark, it, it does feel that people like take the mark and then like just take the ball very quickly. Whereas with the advance mark, when it comes to the forward, they just stop and they compose themselves and they tap the ball over the bar I think regardless of the mark midfield I think they'll always look to play the ball quickly so I'm, I'm not sure it actually has let's uh, get rid of it totally can we not just get rid of it I, 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 no I, I, like, I like the midfield mark I don't like the attacking mark but I like the midfield mark alright okay OTVAM brought to you by Gillette good morning start with Gillette put your best face forward with their new and improved razors it's 